welcome um, to this art talk with our artist in residence, Omolara Williams McAllister. My name is Samantha Cataldo, and I am the curator of contemporary art at the Courier Museum. And I am joined today by Corey Lyford, who is our studio outreach manager um, and a co-organizer of our artist residence programs. Today, we're gonna to be speaking with Omolara about uh, Love's Time in Residence, um, about the different projects and communities that Omolara was involved with, um, as well as the residency program in general. Omolara is the inaugural artist in the community at the Courier Museum of Art, which is a newer um, platform within our artist residency program specifically for artists engaged in social justice issues um, and are specifically socially engaged artists and working with many communities. Um, we're going to talk about um, several of the different activities, uh, events, programs, conversations that Omolara had uh, while here. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Omolara. Um, Omolara, Williams McAllister is a dynamic creator who is committed to using art in service of personal and collective liberation. Omolara's work is a call and response blend of sculpture, performance, installation, community building, adornment, word, sound, song, movement, and photography. It is immersive, interactive, and co-authored by the people who inspire and encounter it. Um, Omar, I'd love to have you further introduce yourself and your work um, to our viewers today, and then we'll talk a bit more about your work here at The Courier. I'm muted. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share my screen so that I can talk about this, hide my sidebar. I think that's how that will work. Do, do I can share my screen, which is great. And this might end up being flipped, but we'll just see how it goes. Uh, so as Sam said, my name is Omolara Williams McAllister, and this is my 10th week of being the artist in community at the Courier Museum. Uh, I'm gonna start about talking, I'm gonna start with talking about my work and I'm gonna focus on the work that I've actually been working on or making during the time of my interaction with the courier. And I'm using that to mean kind of the time that I was applying um, through to the time that I've been here in the residency. I think that the work speaks a lot about my kind of frame of reference and mind space as I've been here and my approach to what I've been doing here, um, both physically in Manchester and during the time of the residency in a variety of other spaces. Yeah, so um, there's me. <laughs> and I just wanna start with the concept of collective action. I'm pausing and I'm likely to pause every time uh, I hear things in the background, the mo motorcycle things. Are they picking up for you all? No, okay, so I won't stop for the motorcycles. They're really loud for me. Uh, collective action. So I wanted to provide a, a definition of collective action because most of my work is really grounded in this, which is uh, an idea that comes from kind of political organizing in various ways, but I also think it's foundational for just culture building and community building. And so I define collective action in kind of three distinct ways that are interrelated. I define it as an individual, a single person taking an action or a group of actions over and over again. And you'll see that as something that comes up in my work. Um, from the collective perspective, it can be a group of people taking an action together. So when you think of kind of like a mass protest uh, or something of that nature, that, that would be a collective action. And that's most often what we use it to mean in community organizing spaces. And then thinking about culture. So a culture is really composed of a group of individual people taking an action or a group of actions over and over again together. Right? So culture is actually the combination of individual collective action and collective collective action. And that's something that I both um, introduce people to in terms of the way that I work and also the way that I invite them to engage with my work in various ways. So it's just a thing to think about and a thing that I'll be referring back to. 
So when I was applying for uh, the career and after they had made the decision uh, to have me come as their inaugural artist and community, I was in process of making a piece called Where Do Monuments Go to Die, which I completed over the summer of 2020 and then first installed um, in the fall of 2020. My name is Omalara Williams McAllister, and the artwork that I'm showing in this exhibition is called Where Do Monuments Go to Die? When people walk into the space, there are several things that you might notice first. You might notice that there is dirt kind of creeping out of my installation space. It has a deep, rich black color that matches the color of the walls, which are also painted black and suspended above the rope, almost like aerial roots hanging from the sky. You see that there's a large video on the wall of a news. There's really this interest I have in saying like, yeah, this thing can be made and it's even easier to unmake it. On the wall opposite that video, there is what I call a new snap flag. So it is a four foot by eight foot sculpture. That's a combination of plywood, staples, and over 7,200 miniature nooses. The video kind of shows you how to pull the knot out and then the flag provides this practice. Here are some little nooses, pull them out, try it, see how it feels. And people who have tried it have reported really feeling a release, which is what I wanted kind of emotional release, that sense of empowerment. We can dismantle these things. We can unmake them. And of course, I chose to have the nooses represent carceral facilities in the United States because the prison industrial complex is a direct descendant of racialized lynch mob violence and slavery. And I'm interested in having us not just symbolically dismantle this object, but also take apart these systems denigrating Black life. So that was really the work that I was making as I'd been coming uh, into the courier space. And um, the, doo -doo -doo, don't know how this functions. I guess it's just that one. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to Yes, this is the right one. <laughs> so that was the work that I was making as I was coming into the career space. And again, going back to this idea of collective action, um, also accumulation, uh, repetition, and collection in general, just collecting a lot of things. You can see how that's reflected in the work. This is a still of the video project projection that happens on the other wall. And I'm just going to show that video for a moment. Google Chrome, cool. Uh, which plays in a loop. It's a two minute, 45 second loop of my hands and they're projected. I don't often actually show it. I had, I didn't show it in the artist talk for this work um, because it's really hard for people to conceive of the fact that it, this video is projected at the size of a wall. So it's 134 inches by 78 inches, which means these ropes, which are real life half inch ropes, um, which is about this big in real life are the same size as the twine that's in the video. So the twine appears to be the same size as the rope, even though your brain knows that it's not that because it's a projection and because my hands are big enough to be able to hold a physical person. What happens in the brain and the body is that your brain is like, no, but it's a real rope, but it's a real size noose, but it's not a real size noose, but it is a real size noose. And the ropes kind of hanging around you in the space um, help to create that cognitive dissonance, which is something that I wanted to encourage in people because I wanted to create a work that was able to make people question their understanding of reality um, and of their perception and to think about the ways that perception can be altered or manipulated or the things that you know to be true um, can often appear to, to you to be false or not. You know, there's this conversation about what is what is actually true, what is actually happening that then makes people be, have to be present and not be on autopilot. Uh, and this work, as I said, this video work was directly in conversation with the soft sculpture that there's a still of here, uh, which is a new snap flag. And as I said in the video, it's made of the 7,200 
uh, miniature nooses. And so the nooses on this flag are actually the same size as the noose in the video, except the noose in the video is projected really, really big, uh, which, which is a specification of the work. And here the audience is invited to dismantle this flag by pulling out these individual nooses. And so the words on the wall read, what's to stop us from pulling it all down? Nothing, go ahead, touch it, try it, take it into your own hands. And so they're confronted with these miniature symbols of something that actually at this scale is still quite, um, quite terrifying for people. Like it's just a very loaded symbol that has a lot of history behind it. And it's also a thing that if you think about it, take a moment now, I ask this to people all the time. Uh, most people have never seen one tied or untied. It's something that like all monsters shows up fully formed. You know, it's like something that's unfathomable even though it's really just a piece of rope that's been repurposed into a tool. And more than being just a piece of rope, a noose knot is actually a slip knot. And so even though it's incredibly difficult and complicated to tie, it's really simple to untie. I think about a lot, the way that I made this work is I'd made another work, which I'm going to talk about now for Who Sins, almost a decade ago. And when I was making this work, which is also composed of miniature nooses, I was surprised at how easy, how hard it was for me to make sure that I didn't untie the nooses accidentally. And I remember being shocked by that because I was like, how come in all of these like movies, scenes, et cetera, new stories that I see about noose incidents, as they're called um, in this book, The 13th Turn, that I read as part of my research. How come I never see anybody just be like, whoop, you know, you see, you always see people like cut the rope down and then it goes and lives somewhere until one shows up again, but you never see anybody just be like, you know, pulling it out. All right, there's nothing here to see and everybody go on about your life. And how powerful would it be for people to be able to just do that, to be like, oh, okay, I see what you did there. You sent me a death threat. Cool. I'm just going to take this rope and put it back to, you know, good use. How empowering would that be? And that's kind of the idea of, um, of that, those two pieces, where do monuments go to die and a uh, new snap flag, which are born from this piece for who sins, which is a cross that's 12 feet across and 30 foot high and has a miniature noose for every person, black person specifically, who was lynched between um, 1988 and 1968, which was when the NAACP and the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, were collecting information on that. Going back to the idea of collective action, I was partially when I was making this piece, thinking about how we hear these kinds of like numbers and statistics all of the time, but our brains don't necessarily process what that volume looks like. So right now, for example, we're still in the middle of this COVID pandemic and sure in the United States, maybe we're close to a place where we can reopen, but most of the world is still being terrorized by this. And we hear these numbers every day of how many people have died and are dying, but they're such big numbers that most of us are like, what does that even look like? You know, what does 200,000 of something look like. And so for me, I wanted to do something that would make it approachable and understandable and um, really illustrate the impact in a span of years of this kind of loss of life due to lynching. And so I made this cross and each of these nooses is like smaller than a quarter, you know, but when you put all 3,440 plus of them together, you get this structure that is 12 feet wide and 30 foot high, which is quite large actually as a piece. And so it does something um, collecting things so that people can see the impact of the individual things all together does something to people viscerally and in their body. And again, I started with this definition of collective action and talking about how this political, um, cultural really, technology, collective action of doing a thing over and over again together to build culture uh, is something, you know, it builds cultures and it builds systems, oppressive ones, but it can also break those systems down and it can build liberated and liberative uh, systems. Uh, like this one, Casa del Viento 2019, which is a wearable sculpture that's a combination of a veil and a fascinator. And we'll talk a little bit about fascinators later because I did a fascinator making class at the Courier, but when you look at it technically, uh, it's again, accumulation, repetition, 
repeating these small actions, accumulating these small things together to make structures here at the scale of the body rather than necessarily at the scale of a room. But I think about the process of making them very similar. And in the same way that the, the sculptures are meant to be liberative, often moving people through um, embodied grief or collective trauma, these masquerades are meant to be liberative too. And rather than the focus being on trauma, the focus is on more squarely on the kind of joy and liberation space. The question of how does masking and adornment of the body create space for people to be able to show up as their authentic selves. We often think of masking as something that covers. And by we, I specifically mean uh, the Western world and more specifically mean the kind of colonizing and colonial powers of the world. But in many of the lineages that I'm descended from, masking has always been understood to be a way to be a channel, um, to be a portal and to step more fully into an aspect of yourself that you might not embody daily and you might also in different ways. And so there's this masquerade, Castle del Viento, uh, which was the first masquerade that I ever made, which is a combination of the first fascinator I ever made and, um, and a move actually in my practice from doing deeply planned and orchestrated sculptural work into also having a space where I worked more intuitively. So those pieces that I just showed, I was like, okay, I have a number, I'm gonna make this mini. You put that mini together, you just see how big it is, it's gonna be in this shape. But for these pieces that I'm about to talk about in this piece, uh, the process was very much like, I thought I was making something and then spirit was like, no, do this. And I was like, I don't know, that sounds questionable. Um, I don't know why we would wanna do that. It doesn't match my vision. It's me having conversations with myself and spirit. And being like, nah, just do it, just, just do it. And me being like, okay, I guess I'll just do it. I still don't think this is a good idea, but we're gonna go with it. And working intuitively, which is new to me since 2019, has really been like a different and wild ride as opposed to my very structured, very planned uh, way of working. Most recently, and during the time that I was at The Courier, I installed not finished, it's in progress, but I at least installed and showed this piece in the beginning, uh, there was corn, which resonates with the work that I did, did and am doing here at the Courier in a number of ways. This piece is made completely from corn and sargum or broom corn, which is the ancestor of corn, modern day corn that we eat. And these red corn cobs that we see at the top of this sculpture are actually corn cobs that I found on the ground um, at the beginning of the pandemic in March, 2020, which said, pick me up, even though I was like, you're on the ground and it's a pandemic and they're literally rodents eating off of you. I feel like this is not what you do at the beginning of a pandemic, but I would walk by them every day and then was like, okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna get some gloves, pick them up, put them in the oven on a low heat, sanitize them. And then, you know, you can't get COVID from corn cobs, right? Uh, we didn't know how you got COVID at that point. I was pretty sure it wasn't from corn cobs and squirrels, but also it just, you know, felt like a, a risky thing to do. But I picked up the corn cobs and I carried them with me from place to place to place. I have a bag of them here, actually, as I sit in the artist um, residence house at the Curry Museum. Um, and they eventually asked to be made into uh, this masquerade, which is all made from corn parts. So these feather looking things are corn husks and these kind of wound things are um, broom corn and these are corn cobs here. And these stick looking things are the handles that broom or the kind of stalk that the broom corn hair comes off of. For me, in the last couple of years, I've really been thinking about how to transition my practice such that the materials that I'm using are ones that are readily and easily available in my local environment. And the reason that I'm interested in doing that is um, because of my commitment to the land, to the earth, and to my fellow human beings and living creatures, which is to say, you know, sometimes I could say, yeah, I want to use we can use cotton. We don't grow or man, you know, manufacture or mill cotton very much in this country, which is interesting because I'm sitting in a mill town, as I say this, a town that was like built on milling textile, <laughs> textiles and fibers. And so, you know, we used to in this town, Manchester, um, New Hampshire is notable and was built around the milling of textiles, but now we import them from across the globe. And so for me, as someone who's working in textiles, I have to think, 
what is the environmental impact of the materials that I'm using? And I push myself to make different choices. And so one of those choices has been use things that are readily available around you, like discarded corn cobs that you find on the street and see how that works. And in the time that I've been at the courier, I've been really thankful um, and have a lot of gratitude for the staff, which has really worked with me around my desire to use things that are already made or that have already been used or that are readily available. And so when we were looking for cloth and fabric for my classes, I asked if we could use old sheets um, from the thrift store. And thankfully people were like, yes, you know, even though it in, was different amounts of work or work in different ways, it, essentially we displaced labor that might have been happening and did happen because those sheets were made by somebody at some point, not here in the United States. Um, but the, the later processing, we displace that labor onto ourselves rather than getting kind of ready-made squares that somebody else had bound the edge of. But it was a lot of work. So thank you all for being willing to do that work with me. Uh, so looking at these corn sculptures, um, and again at Casa del Viento, they're part of this larger project of masquerading. So again, I talked about masking and the way that masking can be used to actually reveal. Um, or to become a channel or a portal for something. And in 2020, uh, my thesis work was supposed to be around these masquerades and it was supposed to be a devised uh, performance with a number of folks who identify as queer and trans and gender fluid um, and different kinds of black. And we wanted to explore embodiment. Like what does it mean to be able to fully be safe in your body in a space with other people who are safe in their bodies and then to create a world to, together. And that idea, again, going back to collective action, <laughs> uh, which I started with was about like, how do we begin now to use the things and the technologies that we have, adornment being one of them as a way to make a culture, which again, you can think about a culture as a group of people taking a series of many you know, actions over and over again all together. How do we transform this culture into a culture that we want? Uh, and using my work in adornment as a way to create a portal for us to begin to envision that not just in words, but with our bodies um, in space. So this is my last body of work that I'm gonna talk about here. Again, thinking about space and and our bodies and what it means to be able to transform space through the ways in the ways that we move through it. And that as in like moving our bodies through it, but also in the ways that we interact with institution, which has been also another aspect of my time here. I have these spatial studies, which are again, head adornments, but I also think of as studies for larger sculptural pieces. And when I was making them, I was thinking a lot about light, shadow, the way that they look different from different angles. I talked again about uh, asking people or inviting people or creating a context where people have to question what they understand, know, or think to be true. And these spatial studies do that because they exist both as sculptures and as head adornments, and also because they just don't look like what you expect them to look like when you're on the other side of them. And so people, we have this habit, and I think a lot of folks have realized it now because of COVID, we're wearing masks. And so you imagine what, other, what the other half of people's faces look like. And then when you see them without masks, you're like, oh, that is not how I imagined <laughs> that to look. And that's kind of the same thing that I'm doing with my sculptural work is often we make, um, often in the culture, cultures that I'm exposed to in these institutions, there are certain values for like sym uh, symmetry, homogeneity, there's shared aesthetic values that allow your brain to like automatically be able to complete a picture. If I see one side of it, I can assume that the other side of it is going to look like this. And I'm going to be pretty close to right on that. And so with these pieces, um, actually they're intuitively made. So I wasn't necessarily trying to do that, but it's the thing that I noticed that I do in my design process is that I like making things that are interesting to look at from every angle. And then in terms of scale, I've understood my work to be now both simultaneously architectural and intimate. So that's large enough to hold you, to hold your body in it when you're looking at the large sculptures or even when you're looking at the head adornments, but then small enough to be held by you. Uh, and a thing that was exciting to me about that is this idea, large enough to hold you, small enough to be held by you, 
is also how I think about community and community building is that a community is something that is large and spacious and expansive enough to be able to hold and support you. But it's also, you know, small and close and intimate enough that it's something that can be held or supported by you. So it's this reciprocal relationship um, and this kind of fluid relationship of being large and small, um, expansive, but not so expansive that it's beyond the scope of what feels um, approachable for a person. So here are some other works in that kind of spatial studies ideas. You can see how it's like not quite what you expect it to be in different ways, or this last one, Space is the Place, which I think is one of my favorite things that I've ever made. I love it because you can actually move it while it's on your head. And so it has that fluidity in terms of being different from every angle, but it also has the fluidity that we have as human beings in the sense that it can change from moment to moment uh, and is dynamic and is able to be many things at once and all of those things being able to be true. So for the Courier Museum, the work that I proposed, uh, that I put in my proposal was domestic work, which I'm gonna share the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the piece is titled Domestic Work. And it is a series that I began in 2018. Uh, and that has come kind of full circle. It's still in progress, but during the time that I've been at the Courier, I have installed my first solo show. This is an image, a panoramic image of it. Uh, it's about 60 feet of wall, which is covered in this work. And the work, again, thinking about something that's architectural, large enough to hold you and uh, intimate, small enough to be held by you, is made of, and collective action accumulation, it's made of all of these little tiny squares, <laughs> individual squares, which are also individual stories that I and other people who have encountered me and the work have contributed to this large, expansive collective narrative that's being showcased in this room, which like most galleries um, was a white walled gallery space, but here has been transformed into a soft black space, which you may have noticed throughout my slideshow that I think of most of my work as existing in these soft black spaces, literally, you know, I don't think of white walls and I often will ask or find ways with the institution to show my walls, to show my work in the way that I imagine it, which is against um, blackness as the background and as the context. And this work, again, small enough for people to hold it, is built to be interactive and to be co-authored throughout its life. And so I collected these stories um, that are on the squares, the embroidered text through conversations that I had while making in public. And I'm continuing to collect them as people are interacting uh, with the installation as it's installed, but interacting with me here too in um, Manchester. So though this individual piece is called Domestic Work, the collective as it's shown, which also includes projections and audience uh, interaction is titled We To Sing America. Not gonna play this video, but I am gonna talk about the process of making the squares because that was the foundation for me applying to this residence, residency. I talked about not necessarily the embroidery tasks, you know, so each of them is hand lettered and hand embroidered and then people have this opportunity to interact with them when they're done. I just lifted this from my other presentation rather than doing a new one based on those, blah, blah, blah. So each of these squares is hand lettered and then it's hand embroidered and then it's hand lettered again and then it gets waxed. And this is the kind of place where I was leaning into metaphor with my application. So I applied with the idea of doing a curriculum that's called Resist. And the idea of the curriculum being called Resist was a play on words. So as a textile fiber-based artist, one of the things that I have built a speciality around is resist to dying. And resist dying is when you dye a piece of cloth, but you use something uh, to keep dye from going into certain parts of the cloth. And so with this art piece, I used wax, which you can see in this image, hot wax. And I used traditional batiking tools to do it. To then make it such that when I dipped the squares into indigo, which is another speciality of mine and another aspect of my work here at the Courier, uh, the rest of the fabric would be dyed blue, but not the place where I had left the wax. 
And the play, and this is the house, this is pieces drying in front of the house that I'm currently living in. The play was, I wanted to think about um, resistance as in resist dying, but I also wanted to think about clearly resistance as in people resisting against cultural systems that uh, seek to oppress them or to limit their humanity or the ability to express or live out their full humanity in some way. And so the idea was that I would teach people indigo dye processes and through the process of teaching them indigo dye processes and various resist dye techniques, we would also get to have conversations, not just about um, you know, resisting dye going in some places, but also resisting culture in various ways in the ways that it needed to be resisted. And so one of the things that I did during my time here, and I think now we're gonna talk about it conversationally, uh, was teach. So I taught Making Art Accessible, a class for adults with developmental disabilities. I taught uh, that once a week. And then I taught two other classes, which were also for adults with uh, developmental disabilities through a partner organization of the couriers called Siddharth Services. And in that class, people learned different techniques or resist dying. And we use the kind of more simple, more accessible, the most simple, most accessible ways that I had in my artillery, which are closer to, and basically in all the cultures they come from, uh, translate to tying and dying. We used uh, folding and dying. We also actually ended up making stencils, which I was pretty excited about. And um, throughout the time, I was able to work with students to be able to understand and interpret abstract uh, designs as being something that told a story or portrayed a narrative of their own design. And so we worked a bit on, um, yeah, kind of the idea of storytelling through abstract designs on cloth, which is something that exists in a lot of the cultures that I came from. So I'm gonna stop talking at this point and uh, share space for the other people to talk and ask questions. And I have some other pictures that I can share both in the slide point and slideshow and just up on my desktop. Thanks, Oh, Thanks for that wonderful walk through your work. That was really fascinating. Um, and in thinking about the RESIST curriculum, uh, you give a great introduction to that work that you did in making art accessible and Siddharth services. Now, the goal of these programs is to really foster a sense of well-being in each student and to create a community of supportive students who enjoy making art together. And this was such a wonderful fit for that. You really fostered that community spirit and empowered people with telling their own narratives through this very different medium, which I know everyone loves. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, what kind of adjustments did you make? What did you think about when thinking of this curriculum for this particular audience? and then setting people up for success? Well, there were a couple of things uh, that didn't have anything to do with this audience at all. So first I would say uh, teaching these classes was the first time that I was teaching on Zoom at all. And so there was a really big learning curve there of not teaching people in person. And uh, the image that is up now is an image of the classroom space that I was teaching from, which is one of the Courier's brand new smart classrooms that they were able to build during the time of the pandemic. I was the first person to teach in those class in those classrooms, and it was my first time teaching in them. And so a lot of the adjustments that I made were about my own learning curve around teaching through techno, you know, technologically based means, period, but then also teaching through this very kind of sophisticated uh, technology where there's multiple switches for multiple cameras and, and in this space that I was not familiar with, um, that I was brand new to, new to. So that was one adjustment is just teaching in a different way, completely different context with completely different tools. And then uh, the other things were just, I mean, you don't know. So I think that oftentimes people assume that because someone processes the world differently than they do, that it is somehow at a deficit or that it's less than what it is that people do. And I think that that assumption does a disservice to everyone. And so coming in 
I was like, like, I don't know what I know. I understand that you were flagging for me that something is going to be different here because I'm teaching people who have been flagged as different adults with developmental disabilities, but I don't know what that different is going to look like. And so part of it was planning a stretch curriculum. So I had four classes, but I planned six classes worth of material because I wasn't sure if it would be slower or faster. I didn't know what people's pacing would be in terms of their approach to the material. And I didn't know what that would be both them coming as individuals as they are, and also them coming to a medium that was completely different. So I think there were a couple things that were different. One, I was teaching cumulative sequential classes, which I think is not always necessarily true in this program. And two, I was teaching in textiles and fibers, which in any art program, unless it's a textiles and fibers program, is just not something that gets taught very often. And so there's just a whole bunch of newness, new technology, new people, new format, new medium. It's just every kind of new that you could deal with. <laughs> I feel like we dealt with people learning my pronouns and what pronouns meant and how to use them, which people largely did a really good job of. Um, and so I feel like that, those were the adjustments that I made. And I would say a thing that I mourned and still mourn some is not being able, I would have liked to have brought more contemporary art in as an example. And I also would have liked to have been able to build towards more conversations around social justice and resistance in particular ways. I think if we'd had like two more weeks, we totally would have gotten there. But it wasn't about, it was more about the time that it takes to do something through technology, the time that it took for me to adjust to teaching in that way, than it was about teaching these particular students. I have to mention here, when you told me after the first class with Making Our Accessible that that was your first class teaching via Zoom, I was very impressed. None of us would have guessed that you were a pro. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, it required a preparation definitely in a different way. I mean, like one of the things that I would have just done in real time, but that I didn't do uh, in real time was prepping work samples. And so I prepped and photographed work samples. So what I'm sliding through here, I actually did it in the winter um, garden at the Thursday late night sessions, the couple weeks before my class started, I would just sit there and work on work samples for people, uh, doing these kind of step-by-step -step images of these work samples as if I was making kind of an Instagram story to explain a thing, how to do a thing for a person is something that enabled me to be able to teach uh, through technology. And it was something that I normally would have to think through, how am I gonna demonstrate this to people step-by-step, step? but I would physically be there in front of them and I could repeat it to them as many times as I needed to and pull someone to the side and show it to them. Uh, but I didn't have that because we weren't in person. We lost that ability to kind of have those one-to-one -one connections in those ways. Um, and also the other teachers who were there to support me in the space were very supportive. We're learning alongside the students, all of these like new things, this bucket full of new things that we kind of sent uh, to their house. And another dynamic I would say too, was that uh, there were things that we wouldn't have prepped. So I would have demonstrated making a die that, though I do ultimately feel that that was a net gain for students, I would have demonstrated making a die that for people, but we wouldn't have made, you know, 15 individual die bats <laughs> for people. So there just would have been less time around that. Uh, but I think that that's actually a net positive because they did have to physically go through and figure out how to do those different parts themselves and they will remember it differently because their body will remember it in addition to their brain. And I'll add to that too, that folks in that class have used those VATs for many more projects than what you led with them on Zoom. We've had a lot of different dying projects and one of the parents who, and I'll mention here that you really involve family members and care partners, which was lovely. Uh, often we have just the students, but this was a really inclusive program for anyone in the homes. Uh, and one of the parents decided to use the Indigo Dye Vat 
to dye her beautiful hair. And so she had some indigo dyed blue hair for the program, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of my favorites. <laughs> that's one of my favorites. And yeah, I'll speak to that for a moment, just including all of the people in the space. I thought it was very important for a number of reasons. One, this was a really involved activity. I had visited classes before I came, so I understood what people were doing. And I will say that in terms of altering my curriculums, never have I ever thought to myself, I don't think that this group will be able to take on this type of thing. It's too complicated for them. And so for me as a teacher, I'm always like, how do I approach this so that it's accessible within this context is the question that I'm asking rather than, is this something that I can do? It's the question of how can I do it? Uh, and other questions that I'm asking is like, who is in the space? So for me, I spent a lot of time teaching in uh, the juvenile justice system where you would have the young people who were being held in prison, um, in jail, children, but you'd also have the guards, you know, or the security people who were supposed to be there. And a the thing that I found is that a couple of things. One, those people can be very helpful or very disruptive. <laughs> it's very important to get people on the very helpful side. But then two, also the classes that I was providing didn't just provide a break for the students. They also provided a break for the guards. And so that break for the guards could be that they didn't have to be uh, in charge of deciding what was happening or doing, you know, they could just kind of take a breath for a moment and they might do that by deciding to disengage. Like I'm just going to sit in this corner and be quiet, or they might decide to do it by engaging because as we know, art and being able to have your hands on material really allows for like some healing, um, support in ways that other thing, things don't. And so I, I wanted that, that was one aspect of it, of having the help and being able to provide space for other people. But also uh, most of people's caregivers and support people I noticed in my, in my visits are, were brown people. Um, and they're the kind of brown people whose labor is invisibilized and who themselves are invisibilized uh, in the course of daily life. And I understand as a person who's chronically ill and disabled, that there is this tension and this desire to make sure that people who uh, have a disability, who are also people who are chronically disabled, I mean, invisibilized, um, are actually engaged as individual people. So there's a thing that folks will do if they see that someone is disabled, then they will speak to somebody else. It's the same thing that people often do with children. If they see that you're a child, that you're younger, instead of speaking to you, they'll speak to the nearest adult and for me, I don't care who you are. If you are a person and you are in a space where I am teaching, that I'm going to approach you as an individual person. And so it felt really important for me to make sure that I didn't participate in erasing the labor of those folks. And that at the same time, I didn't erase the students who were in the class. So being able to simultaneously say, everybody who is here is here. <laughs> like you're all present and participating in some way, right? And so I want to know your name and be able to say your name when I'm speaking to you or say somebody else's name when I'm speaking to them. And also, if this is something that you want to do for yourself as a, a caretaker, I would like to be able to provide an opportunity for you, because you're here, you know, for you to also be able to engage and participate. And so I'm really thankful to the courier for being willing and open to say like, yes, we will send double the amount of supplies so that caretakers can also participate in this activity as they want to. And I'm really happy to know that people have um, taken advantage of that outside of and beyond the space of the class. That makes me feel like I was successful. I definitely feel that you were successful too. And I'd like you to know that I loved having people feel so involved, whether they're the participant or the caregiver, what we you know would have separated into two batches before I plan on going forward with really including people more in these programs and continuing to send that double amount of supplies. Change. For that. Cultural change and cultural change. And such a big part of these programs is kind of the healing aspect, which you had mentioned. And I think we can now transition into talking about a next program on that note that you were able to join us for. Uh, we are so happy to have you join us for the Art of Hope. 
Um, that is a program that the Courier offers that provides art and mental health support for people whose family members and loved ones are suffering from substance use disorder. So I'll mention here that we don't have images of people working on their art for this program, and that's because of the very sensitive privacy nature of the program, so just so folks watching know that. Uh, I'd like to start, oh, by asking you, what made the Art of Hope stand out to you as one of our existing programs that you wanted to join and engage with? Um, and how did you think about your work as being a good fit for that program? Yeah, I have been and was really excited to work with that program because of my own. And I think it's the same thing of working, I mean, making art accessible, but I'm always, excited to work with people that I can find a shared point of reference with. And honestly, you know, if I'm working hard enough, then that can be anybody <laughs> that I can have a shared point of reference with. But I'm chronically ill and disabled. So that's a connection point there. And with Art of Hope, um, you know, I'm a person, part of, you know, my chronic illness also involves me developing codependent relationships with other people um, and having various, you know, chronic mental illness, which is something that is often co-occurring with uh, substance abuse, but something that is also triggered by being in spaces with people who are using and abusing substances. And so having both of those experiences in common with folks was something that drew me to that program. And then more particularly, uh, when we talk about collective action and we talk about community as something that holds us, but also something that we hold, one of the things that I seek to do and find to be really important is to actually expand people's basic um, emotional skill set and emotional intelligence. And so if you look at or think about some of the pieces that I mentioned, you know, through the entire range of work that I talked about, starting with uh, where do monuments go to, to die and thinking about this um, untying of the noose, there's a, there's a technique that's used in cognitive behavioral therapy where they will ask you to think about another story that you could tell, you know, like, how could you tell yourself a different story about what is happening? How can you move from tunnel vision or black and white thinking into more expansive landscape? And so with that project, essentially what I'm saying is we have tunnel vision, we have black and white thinking around the noose as an object. We just think of it fully formed. We don't think about what happened before or what could happen after. And that is putting us in a space where we're stuck in a trauma loop. And I can interrupt that trauma loop by introducing new information into this story and expanding it so that we have a broader perspective and are then able to reclaim our agency. And so you see that also in Noose Not Flag where I'm inviting people to pull um, the nooses. You see it in For Who Sins, which is this monument or memorial, which is like acknowledging a thing rather than ignoring it, allows us then to be able to move through it and move past it. And so really this undercurrent with the masquerades creating a safe space where people are able to be fully embodied. Oftentimes people are abusing substances or using them because they don't feel safe in their body or in their home or in their brain. Uh, and so substances are a way to be able to get away uh, for that, from that. So it may seem like it's not present in my work immediately when you're thinking about it, but this is this ongoing theme that's happening through my work is how can I provide social emotional support and tools for community through the work that I'm doing. And so explicitly with domestic work, I've really been seeing the, the way that that piece can be very explicitly and easily used to support people's development of cognitive behavioral therapy skills um, and dialectical behavioral therapy skills. And those are shortened to CBT and DBT in um, mental health circles. And both of those sets of skills, you know, DBT and CBT are types of therapy that are used to support people who have um, substance abuse issues or people who have mood disorders or personality disorders. And they're also used to support family members because oftentimes when someone near you develops substance abuse, it's easy to then develop a relationship where you start putting their needs before 
yours because you feel like their need is so great and you love them so much and then start to neglect yourself. And the word for that is kind of codependency. And so I really wanted to work with this group because I felt kinship, but also because I felt that I had something to offer um, that would be really supportive for them. And so the things that we did in that space and also in these images um, is that we focused on my piece, Domestic Work, and use that as a focal point. And we kind of tied it all together. People were able to learn about indigo dyeing, which of course I use in the piece Domestic Work. And specifically, we were able to then use the indigo dye to make pillowcases for aromatherapy pillows, which we also made and people were able to take home, which is a tangible tool that can support people um, in times where they are feeling out of equilibrium or they're not sure what to do to support themselves. And then I also engage them in these writing prompts that are directly related again to domestic work. And so one of the ways people are invited to interact with uh, that piece is by contributing their own stories. Where have you been in relationships where you have given of yourself for other people, possibly to your own detriment? And that's the squares that say for you. Um, where have you been in a relationship? How have you been in a relationship with yourself that you've been giving to and caring for yourself? That's the text for me. And then what does it look like to move into a relationship with a community in a space where you're taking care of yourself? And then after taking care of yourself, when you've looked at, you know, what is it possible for me to give? you're then able to give what you can without taking what you need to sustain yourself. And that's the for us. And particularly in the space of COVID and the pandemic, I think there's been this large societal scale shift to understanding the importance of collective care uh, as a form of collective action. We often think of collective action as protest, but then also how can collective care of ourselves and others be itself a protest against the established culture, which asks us to um, have labor ex exploited, our labor exploited, our labor extracted um, from us in various ways in order to continue supporting systems that don't necessarily support us. We talk so much about self-care in that program. Um, we talk about care, taking care of each other, and the importance of rest, even though those can sometimes seem like passive things, but they're really not. They're of the utmost importance. Um, and people have really been enjoying those eye pillows. They've already been telling me. So I want to give you the feedback that they've been enjoying the aromatherapy and the self-care tangible tool that you help them to create. And I'll also end by mentioning about this program that this was our first night that you joined us for that was back in person after being 15 months not in person. And it was just a really beautiful re-entry into that for people to reconnect and to get their hands into this project and think about self-care and taking care of each other as a community. So thank you for that. Lots of firsts. <laughs> That's a good transition to what I wanted to ask about next. Lots of firsts, but also talking about things that you gravitated towards in our initial conversations as we were planning your time here. Um, and that led to the workshop that you did with Families in Transition, which is a local organization who works, um, well, across the board, but specifically the, the spot that we went to with families who were exp experiencing housing insecurity. Um, and you did a die making workshop. So similar to the resist um, format that we've been talking about. But do you just want to talk a little bit about how that came about, um, why it was important for you. And as I said, first, this was the first, not the first time we've engaged with this group, but the first time we've done a workshop of this, of this nature with them and something I think we thought was really special and we hope to do going forward. So we talk a little bit about our, the work that you did with Families in Transition and their, um, their community. Yeah, so I did drop-in style classes, which match. So Art of Hope and Making Art Accessible, which we talked about, were very structured, specific times, specific group of people, people registered, you knew how many there would be, you knew how long they would stay. And then there was uh, Families in Transition and Open Studios, which we talk about, which were not uh, kind of as structured, but which I wanted to make 
in a drop-in model so that people could engage as much or as little that they wanted to. And sometimes that's what safety looks like is being able to have a choice to decide, you know, how long you want to be in a space or engaged and to know that you can step away from it at any time. I wanted to work with families in transition again, because of my own uh, personal experience. And because specifically I talked about this a moment ago, I was talking about how making with your hands can be an opportunity to kind of take a break, to have a moment of pause or respite from your kind of everyday grind. And it's particularly effective art making because it's something that is tactile, that engages your body, right? So both your brain and your body are there and having something that engages your body pulls you into being present. Uh, I know how stressful it is to be unhoused, um, and to be in transition and to be in a space where you feel out of control of your life and really just wanted to be able to take this, this activity to people who are having that experience. Because again, for me, art has been something, I guess I haven't explicitly said this yet, but art has been something that has just saved my life over and over again. I think one of the reasons that I, um, am an artist and also one of the reasons that I'm like physically alive here today is because art was the coping mechanism that I found. And thankfully it's a healthy one and also something that people will pay me to do <laughs> as a professional. And so I wanted to bring it to that space. Yeah, to provide a spot of, of joy or of rest. Um, I was really happy with the ways that it went. The things that were most special to me about working in the family and transition space uh, was being able to work with multiple generations of families at the same time. I think that is one of my favorite things. It's being able to work with people across the spectrum of age, but also with people who already have these relationships and making art together often create space for them to strengthen their relationships and sometimes to explore aspects of their relationship that they didn't know existed. And so that was really wonderful um, for me to be able to do. And that space was really a great space to be able to do it. You know, it's like, you just pick up your buckets, you plunk them down in the middle of the space and you say, here's how you do this thing. Do you wanna do this thing? Um, so that was really fantastic. And I hope that the courier will continue that relationship. And I think that there's a lot of potential there to help people at the organization and people who are moving through the organization as they're looking for housing also begin to understand the courier as a safe space. Uh, museums have a tremendous um, potential to provide service to people who are uh, otherwise marginalized or sent to the fringes in different parts of communities. You know, a museum is this place where you can access a bathroom, where you can sit and rest without people policing your behavior because it's a normal thing to do in a museum. It's just like sit for a moment at a space. It's a place where you can have access to climate control, where you can have access to beauty, um, where you can participate in community without the barrier of the entry fee, uh, which is not always true. I know the Courier is a museum that has um, that has a you know fee for entry structure, but you do have your free Thursdays. And I also think that there's a possibility to develop a relationship where you say, you know, we have four passes that the the families in transition house has, and that anybody who lives there can take these passes and then take their children. To this museum space to have something to do so that they're not sitting in the same small room that um, they're all living in together. So I'm excited about that and I really hope that the collaboration continues. Yeah, and we, we appreciate that and, and we agree. It was um, such a wonderful thing. And as you said, one of the highlights being as you reported to me after, you know, having a whole family sit down and work on something together and feel really engaged. And, and that, you know, we talk a lot about in community work and in uh, art museums in general, how do you measure success, right? Cause it's not, you can't do it in the same way as businesses. It's not dollars. It's almost always not even numbers in any form. So it's always like a qualitative rather than quantitative um, you know, so if you, if you, if you have one really deeply engaged family, I think that makes 
everything is success, like that maybe you changed their day or their perspective on something. And that's sort of like what we aim for. Um, and I think that, you know, you and I have had that conversation before in as professionals on different ends of, of art making and art displaying and, and how we talk about success and asking each other if our relationship and our work together has been successful. So um, for me, I think that was something that you said that resonated with me about that particular program. Um, so I was very happy we were able to do that. Um, well, the other thing, cause I know that we've talked about, cause as people can probably tell, you did a lot while you were here. <laughs> we've mentioned um, the open studios that you had and that kind of um, ran through everything in those smart classrooms um, almost every Thursday night that you were here. Um, and again, our free, our free Thursdays, which was great because a lot of folks were able um, to come through um, where you would be working, people could drop in, you were working at different, on different things. Sometimes you were working on your solo show. Sometimes we were prepping for um, our upcoming workshops. Um, and I wonder if you can just talk about uh, kind of the unique setup that we had for Thursdays and your other residency that you're in and how you saw those interactions going. Yeah, so I was really excited that the courier said yes. Also really excited to be at the courier. One of my lasting impressions is just that it's a place where people said yes. <laughs> which is really exciting because I think of most places as places where people say no, um, which is something that I could talk about, but will not. Um, but I'm really thankful that you all are a place that says yes in, in many, many ways, you know, yes to me, yes to community, yes to trying new things, um, yes to collaboration, yes to growing uh, and learning very quickly and being responsive. Those are very rare traits an in institution um, and even in individuals and institution. So I asked if the courier would be willing to partner with me and an organization called Viz Arts. Viz Arts is an art center in Reston, Virginia. Nope, that's the wrong place. Rockville, Virginia. Lots of traveling this last year. Viz Arts is a place in Rockville, Virginia. Nope, still wrong. Rockville, Maryland. <laughs> so I live in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, and they're all just so close to each other. So it's a place in Rockville, Maryland. And for this year of 2021, I am also their first, lots of first um, art and social justice fellow, uh, technically a curatorial fellow, I suppose. And during my year, I am being financially supported and otherwise supported by them to be able to continue pursuing a work of my own that relates to connecting art to justice. And with Rockville, I mean, with Viz Arts, as with the Courier Museum, some of that has been outward facing, but a lot of that has also been in inward facing, looking at their institution and, and things that they do, like saying, yes, let's include caregivers in these programs, or let's partner with this organization, or have you thought about this policy or way of existing and maybe implementing this sort of thing? Um, and so doing similar work in the two spaces, I was also like, okay, so I wanna do open studios. It's one of my favorite ways to be able to interact with people. Again, because as I said before, it's low bar and it's safe in the sense that you can choose how much you wanna engage or if you wanna engage, there's not kind of, it's both structured and unstructured. I was going to do it with Viz Arts on the internet, and I wanted to do it with uh, the courier in person because we were able to do that by the time I arrived. And then because of these glorious smart classrooms that the courier has, it's like, why not do it at the same time? We can just do it in person and on the internet. And I would say that it was one of my favorite things. I love being able to cross pollinate uh, and connect spaces and being able to. I mean, I really got to do that in ways that were surprising to me, I think. Um, I did it, I did open studios both when I was physically at the courier and there were a couple times that I was not physically at the courier, but was traveling to do, to install work or work on art in some way. And then it was broadcast into the classroom but people could still talk to me. So it was really amazing to have, um, and actually I guess, so the first week that we did it, 
I did a lecture in Seattle for a class in Seattle. And so we started with this really, I had two things. I had a biz art talk about my, my position there. And so we had people from Rockville coming in. And then I had this talk at um, Washington University and we had students from like literally across the country and also in Canada where it was a huge, it was like three pages of Zoom people um, that were in that class that then came into the courier, into the courier uh, to do this lecture. And so we really started reaching far beyond the walls of Manchester, um, New Hampshire, and also reaching into these communities that I didn't know before. And I got to introduce them to the courier um, and introduce them to Viz Arts and introduce them to myself and connect them between those spaces. I think my favorite things that have come out of that, uh, there was a student who came by one of the nights, he was the only student who came by that night and he was with his grandmother and his little sister who was a very small baby. And he came and he did a project and he ended up uh, leaving before it dried, but I later learned from one of the people who does registration for the summer camps that he signed up for summer camps here at the Courier and that his grandmother was really feeling that art uh, was something that supported him in ways that other things hadn't. I think I got the, the impression from the conversation with the person who registered him for classes that there was some concern. I don't know if it was about behavioral issues or about mental health issues. I don't know what the concern was, but I didn't sense any of that during my interaction. I was like, I don't know what these people are talking about. This is a very patient child. This is one of the most patient children I have ever encountered, ever. Um, but I love that when we talk about outcome or in, impact, I love that idea that that family who hadn't been to the museum before came to the museum on a free night stumbled into this art class and is now going to the summer camp. That for me is like winning. And it felt particularly great because um, these were people who were black and these are people who were poor. And these, I haven't seen poor people and black people or people that I would visibly understand or identify as poor or black in the courier very much in the time that I've been here. And so that is super exciting for me. Uh, there was another person who visited who was visit going down to Alexandria, Virginia later in this year and got to see a portion of my work here at the Courier. And apparently he's a very engaged um, participant here and has been to the different programs at the museum. But was also like, oh, this is showing in Virginia. I'm going to go to the show in Virginia. So that was a really exciting thing. And then when I was installing physically in Virginia, but then we were virtually live streaming into the classroom, uh, that day because I was out of town. Um, I had lots, you know, lots of people that I knew from different parts of my community stop by to have conversation. But then there were also lots of people from the museum who stopped by. Um, it was kind of fascinating because I wasn't sure how that day would go. I'm like, is it really interesting to watch me staple Velcro to the wall? <laughs> like, is that something people will watch and engage? But people asked questions and they were interested. And there was at least one person who came back to be like, what does it look like? Did you finish it? You know, what's going on? And so I think uh, the open studios have been really successful. And my goal with them, in addition to cross, cross pollinating and introducing people to different spaces was also to open up people's understanding of what an artist does where it's like, sometimes we do paperwork. And sometimes we prep for classes and sometimes we put up installations, and some, you know, there's this range of things. And I think that we were successful in being able to show that um, as well as providing the possibility when people wanted it for them to engage in a, a new kind of art practice and learn a new, new art thing, which is dying with Indigo. Right. Which people are very excited about a lot of blue fingered fans that yeah. you have now. <laughs> um, so I just want, did want to touch upon the one last component, which you'd already talked about, um, talking about your work generally, uh, before we kind of do our, our little closing, which would be the millinery workshop that we held, um, which was very exciting. Um, I, I, I can't say this to be sure, but I have to say it was probably one of the quickest programs of ours to, you know, sell out, so to speak. Um, obviously the, the workshop was offered um, free of charge, but people were suggested to make donations if they wanted to cover other people's costs to attend. 
Um, so that was really exciting for us. And obviously people were really excited to learn how to make adornments with you. Um, so I don't know if we have images to share of this, but if you want to talk about, um, you know, why you wanted to hold this workshop, it's, it was obviously a little bit outside. I think people can sense that most of the other things were all around dyeing. This doesn't, didn't have an indigo component, but is obviously related to your work and your personal interests and in, in what you investigate in your work. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about this as our way to um, close on all the wonderful things you did while you were here. Well, initially I was thinking about, we were looking at the calendar and one of the ways that I like to choose what I'm gonna do in a community is based on like days or holidays or events that are already important to people or, and that sort of thing. And so when we were in my interview process or maybe we were in the planning process of the residency, it was mentioned that there were bodies, there were houses of worship on three sides of the museum and that there are a lot of churches in Manchester, a lot of churches. Um, and I uh, have been here through Easter and wow. through Mother's Day, which are big holidays for adornment, for head adornment and spaces that I've been in. And that is something that has been popular with elder generations. And by elder generations, I mean, people who were born in like the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, uh, head adornment was something that was more normal then and actually expected even of people of a certain level, level of society. And it was dying uh, by the time Jackie Kennedy came in, but then she came and she wore these pillbox hats and people were like, oh my God, head adornments are back in. You know, and then it was dying again. And then we had young, interesting people marry into the royal family before they left. Um, so that was like, oh my gosh, young, interesting people are wearing head adornments because they're required to by the crown because of various aristocratic uh, rules that I won't get into here. But those images of, you know, like Kate, is it Middleton? Ooh, I should know these things, whatever. Kate Middleton <laughs> getting married and going to things and wearing fascinators and hats. And then Meghan Markle wearing things and going to them specifically as someone from the United States specifically as a black woman and someone who was already a you know film and television star uh wearing these things has reintroduced them back into the mainstream and so I was like this is a thing you know people like this thing and it seems like it could be a thing that would bring people who might not otherwise be engaged in the dye workshops so let's do it and it ended up not being something we could do for Mother's Day weekend just because of promotion though I guess at the rate that it sold out, we probably could have done it, for, but we didn't know. Um, and so, yeah, I it's one of my favorite things to do and it's one of my favorite things uh, to teach and the residencies and the amazing opportunities that I've had in the last year or so, which COVID actually pushed me into working as an artist full-time, which has been a really, not you know the, the best way to transition, but it's been really phenomenal. I've been really thankful for the, all the opportunities that I had and I wouldn't have transitioned to full-time arting without the pandemic, I can very clearly say that. Uh, I hadn't been able to really focus on my adornment-based work because I had shows and exhibitions that weren't that. And so it was both about finding a space for people to connect and creating space for myself to say, I wanna spend more time doing this. Let me create an opportunity for me to do it. That's why I chose uh, to offer it. Was there another question in there? I think I said a bunch of things, but that was that was my main question of, of why you chose to offer it. But the other thing that was uh, kind of important to you that you and I talked about were connections to the Courier's collection, has, and which you kind of touched upon in terms of the historic um, yeah, so significance thinking, of hats and adornment and art. Yeah, thinking about the Courier specifically as a museum that, like many museums in that time that it became a museum, is a personal collection of somebody that was then handed over that specializes in white Americana, um, including, you know, starting with a lot of like furnishings. I've been really privileged to be able to visit the storage, museum storage, and look at the collections, which has been great. Uh, so thinking about um, textiles, because this was a mill town, so you have a lot of textiles and you have like a lot of uh, needlepoint and embroidery samplers and 
a lot of just kind of like domestic items from the house. So things that would adorn the house space, but then you have some clothing things that are made from the mill textiles and things that are particularly um, artifacts, I guess, from the early you know, United States or Americana. And I think uh, Fascinators to the, partially to the point that I said earlier, is something that really connects this idea of craft, which is a through line in the Courier collection, is that you have a lot of things that are art and are also craft. I make that motion because I'm like, not gonna have the art craft argument here. But you have a lot of things that are art. We don't, we don't do that either. A lot of museums do, but the Courier for the longest time really hasn't. Boom. So yeah. you have that um, and you have a lot of things that are art objects that you also live with, exist with and interact with every day. So when you look at the, okay, so the thing that I do is say Andrew Lloyd Webber, who was actually a librettist, a person who wrote music and not a person who built houses. Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> So you have the Frank Lloyd Wright houses and the person who edits this can totally edit that out. You have the Frank Lloyd Wright houses, which are something that, you know, is an object that you live in, again, speaking to architecture and intimacy and design and making. It's a daily, you know, thing that you could take for granted, but is also something that can be art. And so for me, the connection between the courier kind of millinery and fascinator making is that when you think about decorative arts or you think about craft or you think about um basically things that are beautiful that you interact with every day that are also art uh, millinery is one of those millinery making the art of making hats um women's hats specifically is one of those things and i was really thankful to you sam for pulling things um pulling samples from the collection of kind of that engage the idea of head adornment or hat making, which you see a lot in like paintings or, I mean, any institution that has a large collection of Western European paintings, most of those things, you know, women are either naked, you know, completely naked and sometimes with a flower crown on or something or a sheet, or they're completely dressed. And for them that included having head adornment. So there's a conversation to be had there. I mean, literally you have a show up right now called The Body in Art, but about the relationship of the body in art, but also to art in our daily lives. Yeah, I think that's a great connection. I know, um, yeah, that the workshop I think was um, just something so unexpected. Like when has anyone ever attended a millinery workshop? Maybe you have. Or, or done one, but I, I can't, I have to um, guess that our museum has never offered one, at least not since I've been here. Um, and I haven't seen them at other museums either. So I think folks are really excited to learn. Another first. Yeah, another first, a completely new, you know, I don't know if we'd say they learned a completely new skill. I don't know how many of them are going to make another one after, after this one, but to think about, as you said, or to reconsider the line between ordinary and extraordinary every day and special and and can can something that is lovingly made made by an artist crafted specially and thought through also just be something that you just use every day and that is part of your life and doesn't have to be precious and can't things also be precious and useful and just, yeah useful Functional. at the same time yeah one of the things that stuck out with me so, I mean, in terms of the class, there were a couple of things about it. A, that, again, this word is the theme of this talk, but that was my first time teaching in person, in person since COVID. And so I learned some things about some skills, particularly time management, that I had lost in the COVID crisis. Um, but also, when I asked people why they took the class, some people were like, yeah, it was my first time to be around people. But also really interesting. So we had another... Um, multi-generational family situation there, which was very interesting to talk with them about. And they were like, yeah, there was uh, two sisters who were probably old enough to be my grandma. My grandma is young. She's 40 years older than me. Uh, and then there was a, a person there who was probably about my age who was one of their daughter. And they were like, the two sisters said, yeah, our mom would be great at this. Like she would just be, she was a seamstress. She did bridal couture. This is the type of 
activity that she would just be phenomenal at. And I'd ask them, you know, why they hadn't brought her. And they were like, well, usually <laughs> we do bring her to these sorts of things. And because people didn't get to finish their objects, which again was about my time management, they were actually really excited to take it home to their mom and partially have her critique their craftsmanship um, and also partially have them support her. Then there were people who came, like there was one woman who was like, I own hundreds of hats, but I've never made one. And I was like, wow, I just want to see your hats. Um, and she was incredible. I was like, really? Because she was just, she sat in the corner and she individually beaded her wires one by one in a way that I never do, which I was like, oh, it's going to take her forever. But she was the fastest beater in class. She just, I mean, it was phenomenal. And then our youngest person was seven. And that person basically decided to be an artistic director. And when I had come over and was like, she'd made the decision to make a pattern with some of her beading. She was doing like two pink, one white or something like that. And I was like, I'm concerned about time and the time it's gonna take you to make enough of these pattern pieces to do this thing. And so she promptly assembled a team of adults that she then delegated and directed her labor to. <laughs> It was so great to see. And she she did actually get to finish her thing and, and put it in her hair. And she's like, I'm going to wear it to school. So uh, people's interest in it, which some of them range from like, yes, we're Anglophiles. Yes, we just think of British people. But other people were like, I have a collection of hats. Or I just thought this was a great thing to do with my family. Or I just wanted to do something with my hands um, with people or another teacher who was like, I use art to teach other subjects and talk to me a lot about, we talked a lot about how that person might use this things that she learned in her, the context of her teaching. Um, so though in some ways I was like, I felt a little, I felt I definitely mourned not getting people through the completion of their projects. And at the same time was really excited about the reasons why people were coming, the fact that people were incredibly engaged uh, throughout the process, which is a very detail-oriented process that we simplified for them in a number of ways so that it wouldn't be so detail-oriented. Uh, but people stayed and were really excited and engaged. And I've gotten a couple of Instagram pictures of people who finished their, their pieces. And maybe the most exciting, selfishly exciting thing for me is just seeing the design decisions that other people make which is always fascinating to me. I'm like, I would have never put those things together, but they look so good. So that was exciting and a learning moment for me. That's great. <clears throat> so I think that um, we've talked about a lot. I, I have kind of a closing question, but I want to ask Corey if there is anything that Corey wanted to ask or something that Omolara said that you might want Oh, to expand upon. I think uh, O beautifully answered the questions that I had thought of. I would like to share one more thing, uh, if that's okay. We've talked a lot today about uh, how we talk about success, how we measure success. And in art making programs, often you think about the product at the end of the class, the learning that happens, the creative expression. And these are all important things to different degrees and they all happen to different degrees. But I think the thing that I look for in the success of a program is moments of joy, both mm -hmm. in our community members and ourselves and all of us as a group. And I think we'd all agree that there are many moments of joy sparked by these programs. So thank you. Oh, thanks Corey. Yeah. My heart happy. I fully agree. Um, and I think, you know, one of the other things that's come up a lot is it's obvious how much, uh, growth there has been institutionally and I think personally to the staff who's worked with you so I also want to acknowledge in addition to Corey who's with us um, Lynn Thompson who's our assistant director of education and community manager of community outreach um, we have very long titles here that I often forget um, <laughs> Lynn Lynn is fantastic I just couldn't join us today um, and Lynn was uh, intimately involved in all this as well as Carol Fabricant um, our former curatorial project manager um, who recently left the museum, but was a big part of all, all, all of Omolara's projects and onboarding everything. And so I just want to say a quick thank you to them. In addition to, of course, the whole staff, because as Omolara said, when you're an artist in residence at the museum, the museum becomes your people for, you know, um, those two months. Um, so we have learned a lot from Omolara growing in terms of, uh, you know, connections that we've made and will now sustain 
or different approaches to the accessibility of our programs that we've learned through this very strange time of, you know, not being in person than being in person. And this really, um, yeah, there's no other way to describe it than just this, this strange time, this period that Omar has lived through with us of this reopening and some back to normalcy, but still in this period of cautiousness and like how we are able to have meaningful interactions with folks in these digital and in-person ways. And so that's been really um, amazing. So my closing question to you, Omolara, and um, I don't know if there is just one, but if, if you were, if we were to ask, you know, what was your biggest takeaway from the residency or what's the one thing that you were able to do that you feel like help has helped you grow and will be what you're taking on, taking with you to your next, your next adventure, your next exhibition, your next project? Yeah, that's a big question. The answer to it might not be what you expected, but I don't know if you're expecting. I don't have any expectations. <laughs> I don't know if you have any expectations. I think earlier I spoke to the courier being a place where people say yes. Uh, and that has been a game changer for me. So I also said, I, I graduated from my MFA, my Master's of Fine Arts program in spring 2020. So I didn't graduate. My name went across the digital screen as the world tried to figure out how, what was happening during this COVID pandemic. So that was in May, it was three months in and people were still, or two months in and institutions were like, we don't know what's happening, but I guess you're graduated. And so I graduated with my MFA and I thought that I was going to engage in some kind of survival work for which for me often involves making artisanal coffee um, <laughs> for other people. Don't drink coffee, but I know a lot about how to make it um, and a lot about coffee and that I would continue my studio practice and kind of applying for things and building bodies of work while I did this other thing to make money to be able to sustain myself. And COVID was kind of like, nope, no coffee making. We're not doing that anymore. We don't go to coffee shops. <laughs> you can't make coffee at home. <laughs> it's not how that works. And, um, and so I got pushed into art making full time, which is amazing. It's been incredibly amazing. Uh, but also for artists like myself who are emerging artists who are earlier on in our career um, I, or similar, you know, it's like we and I, I'll move back to I statements. I, there are a lot of things that I don't know and that I don't understand and that art school doesn't teach you that life just does, you know, about like contracts or what does it mean to be in an institution or what are you do? And I've, I've worked in, for example, the nonprofit world for a long time. So I know how to ne negotiate a nonprofit contract. I know what I ask for. I know what people owe me. Um, I know what I can ask for that may be on the norm, but is something that I need. But in the art world, I'm still really figuring out what kind of opportunities exist and uh, what support can look like. And so it's been incredible and literally, yeah, I mean, it's hard to state what the impact on my trajectory will be because now it's happened. <laughs> so there's like a branching off alternate future in which it doesn't happen. But in thinking about what I know is possible in terms of being like a queer, black, disabled, young, poor artist who's working explicitly with community people and who's working in ways, you know, I'm working in ways that many of which are still new to institutions or the ones that are very, very old, like working with textiles and fibers or millinery are things that are marginalized within um, institutions are not really considered to be, you know, art, high art or fine art in different ways. And so to be in a space where um, I'm so fully and fantastically supported is something that I just won't forget. And now I know that that's what I'm owed and that it's possible, you know? And so that changes the ways that I move. I'm fairly certain that it'll save me from being in lots of like, not good exploitative <laughs> situation with other residency spaces and really has and will empower me to say no to institutions that don't do that, you know, where people might say that's not possible. And I'm like, mm, actually it is. Got an example, lived it, it was great, you know? 
And so that is kind of the largest thing that I feel that I'm taking away from this is like, what does it feel like to be like really truly fully supported in my work as a human being, as an artist, as a person who walks in my values in a very specific and intentional way, what does it mean to be supported for people to not show up knowing or being on the same page? But, you know, the instance that I asked for something or I pointed out that something was at an issue, it would be addressed. You know, the thing was, yes. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm sorry, that's not, you know, there weren't excuses. There weren't kind of placations. There was no like, sweeping it under the rug or being like, no, that's just that one person. <laughs> you know, It was like, yeah, you're right. That's a thing. And, and then it was addressed, you know, almost immediately. And so that's my biggest, um, that's really my biggest takeaway. Just every aspect of this residency has really been structured in a way that communicates that artists are valuable and that our work is valuable and that we deserve to be supported in a way that allows us to live, you know, that isn't where we're then also struggling to be here. And so having this house space to live in, um, having you all make the adjustments that I asked within the house space so that it could be accessible for me during the time that I've been here, um, the financial support that's provided by the residency um, the human resources support, you know, I, like, I don't, there's not very much that I could change about this residency experience. I mean, the things that I have are very small, you know, it's like, get a lid for the trash can, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> generally it's just like, you know, maybe your entire staff should learn what racism is, you know, that's usually what it's like going into an institution, but it's just not that here. So I'm really thankful um, for that. And having that support and having that space has allowed me to be able to put up my first solo show and um, be able to, I mean, I left to do a site-specific installation. I did another installation while I was here. So it, I, yeah, I, I don't know, ask me in five years. <laughs> it's been five years what it looks like we will and we'll we'll look forward to following everything that you do and um hoping that you're following us and that we can both be proud of what we've each accomplished and moving forward we totally didn't talk about courier blue but it's for another time i almost just brought it up but i thought it was <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it was too much let's mention really quickly as we close um, the Courier Museum of Art commissioned an installation by an artist named Constantine Demopoulos, um, who did an environmental art installation called the Blue Trees. So we have blue trees on our campus. They're environmentally safe colorant. Obviously, as you've been hearing, Omlara has been working in indigo, also blue. Um, and so uh, Omlara was very drawn to the fact that there's this very specific Courier blue theme. But also what I was going to mention that, oh, um, I don't think didn't mention and showing the full installation um, of the domestic work pieces was that the courier blue, the blue vat that was made at the courier is super dark and very different than all the rest of the blues. And so in that way, the courier will always stay with you and your work. Yeah, it's been, so I can, um, I can share this and also we can mark it again if you come back and you're like, there are pictures that we want to show. So this is a square of the piece uh, dyed in courier blue uh, sitting on the porch of the house. And I should say a name that needs to be said in the context of this talk is Yasemine, who is a teacher in the um, Siddharth services classes and is a person who has supported me professionally and personally in the time that I've been here. Part of it as serving as my studio assistant to help me get my solo show done, but also was a person who helped me in the fascinator class and in the classes that um, families in transition and who came to open studios and has just like been the spectacular presence across my time at the career as a fellow person who is not white, um, who's also working within this the Courier Museum as a, an art institution. 
So this square is Courier Blue. And when you look across the installation um, of my work, you can see that there is a very clear color gradient that's happening across it. And I can show these, these images again. But you know, in this panoramic view, you can see that there are all sorts of different shades of blue that are happening. And in particular, this section has a lot of the courier blue in it, which coincidentally, because honestly, vats do whatever they decide they're gonna do when they're gonna do it, just happened to be a very, very similar shade of blue to the blue trees. And it really didn't have to be, because if you look at, for example, this part of the installation, I don't know if there are any detail shots in this, but if you look at different parts of the installation, they came from different vats and they really are different colors, different shades, different qualities of blue. Some of the blues have a purple undertone. Some of them have more of a gray. Some of them are more of a whisper of color than kind of a very bold thing. But the thing that these vats gave me is the darkest blue that exists in this installation, in this work. Um, and it's a blue that again is the same blue as the trees. And so I think of, and will continue to think of that blue as courier blue. And because of the nature of indigo as a dye, which does not react to light in the same way as other dyes do, but more reacts to rubbing, to touch, as a way for the dye to degrade, these will stay courier blue even as uh, they're exhibited and they sit under light. And when I think about this piece, which is still growing, you know, currently I can walk you through the piece and say, these ones I dyed in this vat and these ones I dyed in this vat. And I can tell you what part of my life I was in and what color that is and where the vat is. So it will be forever part of the story of this piece because when I get to these blues, I'll be like, this is courier blue. And then I'll talk about the blue trees. And then I will talk about how I think that the courier should change its official color from red to blue because clearly you all really like this blue color or we do, I don't know. We do too. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I think that was a perfect way to end because I think like, as Corey said, the joy and the relative of reverence that we were able to have among these serious topics and these really important conversations that happened around your work was one of the really special parts about having you become a part of the courier for these last two plus months. Um, and so thank you again for saying yes to our invitation to being with us for being here for this talk today. Um, and we were so pleased to have you have you with us and we're looking forward to following you and, and having you you know continue to be part of the couriers network um yeah so thank you omalara thank you Corey, for being here and thank you uh those of you who are watching